Hey. Good morning. Thank you guys for being here. Um, what I want to talk about, we have an hour together, actually a little less, we're starting a few minutes late, so um, I want to get right to it. What we're going to talk about today is um, how to build successful teams inside digital product organizations like Google and others, and how to do so focusing really on uh, a variety of different things, including um, evidence-based decision making, uh, customer centricity, and really great design. And uh, to, start, uh, to start off, I, I, you know, I don't know how much you know about me, but I want to share a quick personal story to start off the conversation. Um, 19 years ago, uh, I graduated from uh, undergraduate school. And uh, my first job was with the circus. I ran away. I graduated on Saturday. Monday morning, I joined the circus and spent uh, the next six months on the road with this circus right here, the Clyde Beatty Cole Brothers <laughs> Circus, which at the time was the largest three-ring tented circus. Um, spent six months on the road with them traveling up and down. It was an I-95 circus is what they called it. And uh, I saw uh, the circus. We worked every day, no days off, two shows every day, three shows on Saturday. So over the course of six months, I saw the circus 400 times in a row, note for note, word for word. And uh, needless to say, my children will never be going to the circus, at least not with me. Um, the, the interesting part, too, is um, I was driving home. Actually, the other day, I was in the city, and I live in New Jersey. And uh, there it was. It, I hadn't seen it in probably in 19 years. And it was set up on, on Route 80 just outside in New Jersey. And um, it just looks a little slightly different, but it smelled the same. I went by there to see if anybody I recognized was there. And over the course of the time that I spent uh, in the circus, I met a lot of interesting people. Um, one of the interesting people that I met during that time was uh, Steven Tyler. That's Steven Tyler right there. And that's actually me next to him <laughs> 19 years ago. Time's been a little rough uh, to my hairline in that time frame. But that was really interesting. He would come to the circus, and we all got to meet him. Uh, he's done well. He's preserved himself rather well over the, the last 20 years. Uh, he's got that secret formula. Um, another really interesting person that I got to meet while I was there was this guy. Uh, that's the human cannonball. And um, uh, in case you can't see him, that's him at the top being loaded into the cannon. And in the circus, there was a, a lot of downtime. A lot of, you know, we worked two shows every day, but once the last show was finished, you didn't have anything to do until the next day when the next show started. And so there's a lot of downtime, uh, really no internet in 1995, uh, certainly not mobile internet. And so you get to talking, and, and one of the questions that I found fascinating and, and I wanted to ask was, how does one become the human cannibal? Right? What's the career path to ending up <laughs> in this particular position at some point. So I asked him, and he told me the story. And the story that he told me um, is, uh, is fascinating. And as these stories tend to do, they start with the previous human cannonball. Right, that's how these stories have to start. And so the, uh, the, the previous human cannonball had this job before this guy. And the way that this trick works is it's not a real cannon in the sense of uh, there's no fire or anything. There's a spring-loaded mechani mechanism in there. The guy slides down. The ringmaster hits a button. There's a puff of smoke. And then he, he shoots out, you know, pushes him out of the cannon. And he lands on the other side of the, uh, the tent in a, in a net of some kind. Now, the way that they knew where to set up the net with the previous human cannonball was they had a dummy, a mannequin, that weighed the same as the previous human cannonball. And what they would do is they would drive this red truck into the tent. They would aim the cannon. They would load the mannequin in. They would fire it. And they'd kind of see where it landed. And they would put the net up there. And we did that every other night, because we changed venues every two days. Um, one night. We were running late, or the, the previous human cannibal, I, I wasn't there that year, they were running late. And uh, they got to the, to the next place late, and they didn't have time to test where to put the net up. And so they got the truck in the tent, and they, they aimed it, but they left the dummy outside uh, overnight, and it rained that night. And the next day, assuming everything was exactly the same, the previous human cannibal and his team loaded the dummy into the, uh, into the cannon. They fired it. They saw where it landed. They put the net up. And that afternoon, in front of 4,000 children, the previous human cannibal waved goodbye to all those kids, <laughs> loaded himself into the cannon. They fired him off, and he sails way past the net. Right. Tragic story. He doesn't die. He ends up uh, severely injured, as you could imagine, from such a flight. And he goes back to Florida, where all circuses come from, in case you didn't know that. Uh, that's where they're based, but that's also where they come from. And he sees his pool guy. His pool guy is this guy. 
And he says, hey, would you like a job upgrade from pool guy to human cannonball? You only have to work four minutes a day. And here, here are the risks, though. <laughs> and the guy took the gig. And so that's how this guy ended up as the human cannonball. Um, why am I telling you this story besides it's just kind of being a fun story to tell and a fascinating look into this weird subculture that I was a part of very briefly? Um, the reason is this. The human cannonball team, the previous human cannonball team, made the same assumptions every day. Everything's exactly the same, so we should work exactly the same way. And assuming that the results that we get will be exactly the same. But as it turns out, the assumptions that they did make were wrong on that one day with very tragic consequences. And the same thing is true in the world of software these days. The way that we've built software in the past and the way that we're building software today and where it's headed are changing. And the assumptions that we're basing the way that we build digital products don't work in today's realities in the way that we're moving forward. And, and, and the reason for that, uh, and you guys should know this really well here, obviously, is that software is eating the world, right? Every business that's of scale in the 21st century or every business that seeks to scale in the 21st century, at its core, is a software business. It's a digital business. And this became really evident recently uh, with the leaked New York Times innovation report. I don't know if you guys had a chance to read this, but this is a fascinating document. It's an internal audit that the New York Times ran for six months to see why BuzzFeed and The Verge and Vox and Vice Media were eating their lunch. And at the, at the heart of this, at the root of all this, this 90-page document was the fact that the New York Times saw itself as a journalistic organization that happened to deliver content through a digital channel, amongst other channels. Whereas the recommendation was to flip that on its head and think of them, they needed to think of themselves as a digital company that happened to do really great journalism. And that's really where the disconnect is for this company and a lot of the companies that I work for. And we're seeing this across the board, right? We're seeing it at FedEx, for example. What business is FedEx in? You could say it's logistics, but in reality, it's the software of logistics. It's the running of logistics. And um, mo I think in the past, in, in years past, we've seen it as, as software comes into play into existing industries, the typical reaction from those industries is to push back, right? It's to, it's to say this is not the way that we'd like to, to, to work. Software is not going to disrupt us. And there's no way that we're going to sell our music on this particular, uh, in this particular way or, or use this particular technology. In case you're curious, that's Lars Ulrich from Metallica, who was really loud and, um, and very, very um, present in the fight against Napster. When Napster first came out, there was no way that he was going to allow Metallica's music to, to be sold that way. Surprisingly enough, uh, Metallica is now available on Spotify, right? So software inevitably eats the world. And we're seeing this again in, in the world of, of cars with, with Tesla, right? Tesla's trying to sell directly to consumers. And what is the auto, automotive dealership lobby trying to do? Right? Litigate them out of existence, right? They're suing them over and over again so that, so that they can't bypass the dealership and change the way that we sell and upgrade and service our cars. Netflix is another great example, right? No one ever thought when Netflix came around that we'd rethink the way that we consume media, much less produce it. And yet today, try to find a blockbuster that's still in business, <laughs> right? Now, what's interesting is that when you're making products in the, in the physical world, uh, it is, you know, and you've got this assembly line model of production, uh, it works well when you know exactly what the end state is going to be, how it's going to be used, and what it's going to look like. And that's great if you're making cars or TVs or even cell phones. But what we've done is we've taken this model and we've uh, applied it in many companies strictly, uh, directly to software, where there's become this kind of this, this, this assembly line model of software development. Someone has to define it, and then someone has to design it, and then someone has to develop it and test it and deploy it. And what's interesting is that in software, we don't know what the end state is going to be. In fact, I would argue that there is no end state to software. And I would also argue that we really don't know exactly how our customers are going to use the things that we put in front of them. And so using this model starts to break down. And it starts to break down for this reason. And I think, again, you guys know this better than, than most companies, that software has become continuous. There is no end state. We just simply keep improving it, optimizing it, iterating it, moving it forward. There is no finished product. Right? There is no big release. There's just continuous deployment and continuous uh, release to our customers. And then ultimately from that comes continuous learning. What I think is fascinating is this, uh, and I'm curious how this compares here. Uh, this is how often Amazon pushes code to production. Right? 
some customer somewhere sees new bits every 11.6 seconds at Amazon. Now, that's staggering. That's amazing. Right? Five times a minute, they are taking tiny risks, they're trying new things, and then they're listening. They're sitting back and they're listening. They're sensing the response from the market. Did they like it? Did it change their behavior? Did it get them to do something differently? If it did, terrific. Let's scale that out. Let's optimize it. Let's design it better. Let's make it easier to use. And if it didn't, let's learn why and roll it back. Now, the impact, of course, is that the learning is huge. But if you get it wrong and you roll it back, the failure is tiny. And so taking these tiny risks allows them to develop this sensing layer with their customers. Right? They're continually having a conversation with their customers. So they're able to sense very quickly. And then, in theory, they can respond equally as quickly. This is working well. Let's scale it out. This is not working well. Let's find out why, and let's try it again a different way. Now, the interesting thing is that insight has two sides, right? We can't simply just measure and assume that we know why something is working or not working, right? That's the quantitative side of things. Insight also has a qualitative side. We have to understand why people are actually behaving this way. So what are they doing is the quantitative side, and why they're doing it is the qualitative side. And, and together, we can build a 360-degree de view that, that allows us to react very, very quickly. By comparison, this is where I used to work a dozen years ago. Right? Our feedback cycle, just to give you a sense, Amazon gets feedback, let's say, every uh, five times a minute, potentially. Our feedback loop at AOL 12 years ago was 12 months. We would work for six months to get every bit of code and design perfect because we had to print 20 million of these right? and then send them out to people in the mail. And that's how people consume software. So six months of work to get it done, ship it in the mail, wait for people to install it, see how they use it, six months to collect data, and then to ship again. Right? It's a 12-month feedback loop, whereas today, five times a minute, you can get that feedback. Now, back then, it made sense to try to get it as perfect as possible because, again, you're making 20 million copies of this particular disk. Today, we can update that much more efficiently. And because of that, these industrial era management tactics don't work with continuous software. We can't manage an assembly line and optimize a production process because we don't know what that end state needs to be. We have to continually figure it out, sense it, and respond to it. And so as makers of digital products, as makers of software, working in this continuous world, there's a few questions that we need to answer for ourselves. The first is this. What does this continuous world mean for the way that we build products and organizations? It's not enough to just change the way that we build products. We have to build the companies and the teams around those products that can work in this reality and that can do their best, their best in, within this new world. Right? The second question is this. How can we take advantage of all this information? We've got all this information coming in, quantitative data after quantitative data, right? assuming you're doing the research underneath it as well, and you've got qualitative and quantitative. How do we actually build a team and an organization that can take advantage of that information? And then lastly, how can we maximize the creativity, the learning, and then ultimately the productivity of, uh, of our teams in an effort to do their best possible work, to build the best possible products for our customers? And so in order to do so, in order to survive in this continuous world, we have to build a culture of learning. That's the key here. Right? We have to change the mindset Right? It's not enough to just deliver software. We have to actually deliver learning on a continual basis. That's what the Amazon teams get to do with 11.6 seconds of release. They're building a culture of learning. Uh, my friend Dave Gray wrote a book about a year or two ago called The Connected Company. And it's a terrific book, and I highly recommend you read it. Now, in that book, Dave talks about two different types of, of corporate strategy. The first is deliberate strategy. And deliberate strategy comes from the industrial era mode of thinking, where it's the executive suite that has all the ideas. That's where the creativity is. We'll come up with, with everything that you need to do, and then we'll, we'll give it to you guys, and you can go forth and execute. And that's the reality. And what happens in that is really interesting. I'll show it to you in this, in this really short video that I've got in here about what actually happens when uh, you take deliberate strategy to an extreme. And that's, uh, it's Johnny Depp as Willy Wonka illustrating my point for me here. You mean that's it? Do you even know what it is? 
It's gum. Yeah. It's a stick of the most amazing and sensational gum in the whole universe. <laughs> know why? Know why? Because this gum is a full three-course dinner all by itself. <laughs> why would anyone want that? It will be the end of all kitchens and all cooking. Just a little strip of Wonka's magic chewing gum, and that is all you will ever need at breakfast, lunch, and dinner. This piece of gum happens to be tomato soup, roast beef, and blueberry pie. In most cases, deliberate strategy yields a situation where you end up with a customer asking you, why would anyone ever want that? Right? Which is the worst possible thing you can hear when you actually put your product in customers' hands. Right? The second worst thing you can do is exactly what he does there, which is fall back on your marketing notes to justify all the assumptions that went into making that product. Right? It'll be the end of all cooking and all kitchens, as if people don't want to cook and don't want to spend time in their kitchens. Right? And again, at the beginning, when you set out to solve a business problem or a customer need, we have no idea what that end state is going to look like. I think this is a perfectly good example. You could walk past these two hippies 40 years ago right, and never think, never know what the end state was actually going to be for these two particular individuals, right? And again, that's the same thing with the products that we make. And so what's the, what's the alternative? The alternative, of course, is emergent strategy. It's different and it's organic. It lets companies learn and continually develop new strategies based on this ongoing culture of hypothesis and experimentation. Right? It takes uh, a bottom-up approach that says the people who are closest to the customer, the people who are making the product, probably have the best ideas about how to solve this. We need to build a team that allows them to try this out, and we need to build an ecosystem around them that allows them to run these experiments while not crashing the system as a whole so that we can keep doing business. That's where that emergency, uh, emergent strategy comes from. And again, we hear this from a variety of executives. Amazon, right, you need to set up and organize so that you can do as many experiments per unit of time as possible. Eric Schmidt calls them at bats. He's talked about it at Google, about how we got to take as many swings as possible at something to make sure that we get it right. And so in order to build a culture that supports this way of thinking, of learning, of experimentation, we have to think about the structure for it. And the structure for it is the team. It's the, the atomic object of a culture of learning is the team. Right? That's the smallest that we want to go. Right? We don't have a particular rock star that can answer all of our questions. Right? We want to build these teams. And the question becomes, then how do we build these teams? What, uh, what makes up an innovative team and a team that can take advantage of this culture of learning? And I'm going to talk about three, three different things. The first is the anatomy of the team. What's the makeup of the team? The second is how do we task the team? How do we tell the team what to do? And then lastly, how should the team work? Should they work in an agile process, in a waterfall process, a lean process, whatever you want to call it, OK? Let's start with the anatomy of the team. What is the makeup of the team itself? And to do so, I'm going to start with a series of anti-patterns, right? How not to build innovative teams. The first is this. Putting people in silos breaks up the communication cycle. It isolates team members and forces them to communicate with written documentation. Everybody feels like a line worker. I'm going to do my thing and hand it off to the next person. And because of that, no one has ownership of the whole thing. Everybody feels like a service provider, right? It just passes through my department. I add my cone of paint on my assembly line, and it moves on. Right? No one has a sense of the whole. What are we building? Who are we building it for? What's the problem that we're trying to solve? What does success actually look like? How does this fit into corporate strategy, right? Why are we even working on this? And worse, there's no collaboration that takes place. And collaboration really is, where, is the secret sauce of innovation, right? That's where learning comes. That's where innovation comes from, that building off of each other's ideas, right? And I know this firsthand. Um, uh, just Actually, just down the street from here, I used to run a UX team at a company called The Ladders. I worked there for about four years, starting in 2008. And my job was to come in there and build a design practice. And the first thing that I did was I set up a silo. That was our silo. And then every time somebody needed work from us, they would come to us. And I played the traffic cop in the center. Every time an, you know, and we need some design work, I provided some insight. Right? Uh, product management said, hey, we need some work. I said, terrific. Bob's got some bandwidth. Let's give it to Bob. Engineering said, we've got a little bit of work over here. Terrific. Bob's got some more bandwidth. Let's give it to Bob. Marketing says, hey, we need the, the website spruced up. Terrific. Bob's got a fraction of bandwidth left. 
let's give it to Bob. Now Bob's supporting three different projects a day, and every day he's coming in deciding which two people he's going to piss off today. Right? Because you can't have three number one priorities. You've got to pick one thing and move on to it. Right? As soon as you build that silo, people do just enough work to move on to the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. And, and just because design is in the center here doesn't mean that this is unique to design. Right? Engineering could be the center here, or product management, or, uh, or marketing, and so forth. Right? We've got to get people uh, distributed differently. And so the question then becomes, right, what team structure facilitates this culture of innovation and learning? Four qualities. The first is this, small. Keep your teams small, six to eight people, roughly. What Again, I, I quote Jeff Bezos a lot. I like what he's doing. Um, uh, what he calls a two-pizza team, if, uh, two American pizza teams. It's worth quantifying. Um, that uh, if you can't feed your team with two pizzas, it's too big. right? Six to eight people. Um, that way you know who everybody is. You know who to go to when you need something. And there's amazing accountability. There's nowhere to hide. If there's six people on a team and someone's not doing their work, you know very well who's not doing their work right away. Second, take those six to eight people and co-locate them. Put them together in one place. Not on the same campus, but in the same area. So they're sitting next to each other so that they can talk to each other, so that they can reduce the feedback loop from each other as quickly as possible. Now, the reality is I know for you guys, you've got multiple offices. Where I work, we've got multiple offices. If you have to work with a distributed team and you want to build this kind of this uh, hypothesis-based, experiment-driven approach to, to building products, you at least have to be awake at the same time. Okay, you've got to at least have some overlap during the day. I have colleagues in Singapore. They're fantastic people. I never get to work with them. Right? It's a 12-hour time difference between here and there. So we've got small, co-located, and uh, next, dedicated. Everybody's working on one project, this project specifically. right? That's what we want people working on. As soon as we steal somebody off to work to fix a bug somewhere or to work on an executive pet project, they're not working on our project. And we're a small team, and so we're waiting for them to come back. And we can't move until they come back. And the context switching is costly. It takes time to ramp down and to ramp up to each one of these ideas. Small, co-located, dedicated, and lastly, self-sufficient. The team should be able to do whatever it needs to do. <coughs> if it needs to write code, someone can write code. If it needs to design, someone can design. Research, someone can research. Right? Product management decisions, somebody needs to be there to make that. It doesn't necessarily mean that you need representatives from all of those disciplines. You just need the competencies on the team so that the team can make those decisions at the pace that the information comes in. Remember, we're seeing insight and information come in super fast. The team has to be capable and empowered to react to that. So those are the four qualities of a team that values learning and innovation. So then the question becomes, how do we tell the team what to do? How do we task the team? Right? This is certainly a viable option. Up here, you can just yell at them for a while. And I've had bosses who have tried this strategy. <laughs> it works temporarily until someone quits and finds a better job. But in reality, what are, what are some ways to task the team? And once again, I'll share some anti-patterns. My first and my favorite anti-pattern is the roadmap, the product roadmap. I don't know if you guys make those or not. Uh, I've made a lot of them in my life. And, and look, they're compelling documents, right? They tell a great story. We're here, and we're going over there. And there are five steps between here and there. And this is what's between us and the deadline. And this is when we'll launch, right? The end comes at this particular date. And so we convey this idea that we've fixed scope and that we've fixed uh, the, the deadline as well. Now, I don't know about you, but in the 17 years that I've been building software products, every time we've fixed scope and fixed time, one of three things has happened. Uh, we've moved the deadline, we've reduced scope, or we've worked in crunch mode for the last three weeks of the project, 80-hour weeks to get it done, and then we all resign at the end to go find jobs somewhere else. Right? In reality, roadmaps look like this, because again, there's so much unknown and so much complexity that goes into software development that we simply can't predict exactly where these challenges will come up. Something that was easy turns out to be hard. Right? There's, a new, there's a new technology that's entered the marketplace, and it's radically shifting the way that we actually deliver our service. We have to be able to bounce around like this. And that's the reality. We can't simply predict exactly when we'll be done and exactly what it will look like when we get done with it. Right? This is how Guilt Group does it from a recent blog post. They say they don't maintain a roadmap document. Their roadmap is simply the sum of active initiatives. Initiatives are business goals that they're trying to achieve. And every so often, they revisit the prioritization of those business goals. Are we making progress? Is it still worth it for us 
to continue pushing in this particular direction, right? No specifics about exactly what we'll launch and when. And we've seen this from the authors of the Agile Manifesto. This is one of them, this is Kent Beck, and he tweeted this a while back, and he said, look, product roadmaps should be lists of questions, not lists of features. Because when you have these product roadmaps that are lists of features, we're incentivizing our teams to deliver output, to deliver features. And when we deliver nothing but features, we end up with product bloat. Look, this is the Microsoft Word version of a guitar. Right here, right? 95% of this guitar is useless to 95% of the people who would actually pick this thing up. This thing was specifically created for Pat Metheny, and really only he can really do justice to the entirety of this product. The rest of us can probably make out a few of the notes on that, on that long neck right in there. But this is what we get in product suite after product suite when we incentivize our teams to launch features, to generate output, and that's what roadmaps do. They drive us there. Right? At, the, at the end of the day, right, shipping a product is not a measure of success. Too soon? <laughs> Sorry. Right? Simply launching the product is not a measure of success. The reality is, did we change customer behavior in a positive way? Right? Again, as we push features and features out, all we end up with is feature bloat and products that should do things very, very simply and very cleanly. Right? Now, interestingly enough, most companies currently manage to output, to features, to getting out the door, because it's easy. It's binary, right? Did you ship it? Yes, we did. Terrific. You get to keep your job, get a raise, get a bonus, whatever it is. Did you not ship it? Terrific. You get fired or reprimanded or, or whatever it is, right? Instead, we should be tasking our teams to achieve business outcomes, right? Business outcomes are a measurable change in customer behavior. It's an objective measure of success. Right? Did we get customers to click on more ads? Did we get customers to come back more often to the search results page? Did we get them to come back less often? Right? Because we're giving them the right results. Those are, cha are measurable changes in customer behavior. And that's how we should task our teams. We give them a problem to solve, not a solution to implement. Now, the interesting part is it's a, it's, it, this gets messy. It's a big can of worms. Right? It's not a binary thing. Right? If you task your teams to get more people to, to sign in successfully into your product by 50%, and over the course of six months, they increased it by 32%. Did they fail? Did they succeed? It's not, it's not as clear. Right? It's messy, so it's more difficult to manage, and many companies stay away from this. Instead, we have to get granular. We have to give teams uh, these outcomes that they can directly attribute to the work that they're doing. Right? Decreased shopping cart abandonment by 15%, right? Did the work that we did actually do that, right? Uh, increase the number of times a customer visits each month. That's the kind of success criteria we want to give people and then let the teams figure out how to actually achieve that goal. Interestingly enough, I was on a project over at the ladders just like this, just to give you an example. I was tasked with moving a metric called job seeker response rate. Job seeker response rate was the number of times a job seeker responded to an employer contact through our system. The team that we put together was a small, co-located, cross-functional team, and their task was to move this number, which was our current job seeker response rate, 14%, to 75%. That was it. No further instructions were given to that team. Your job is to get that number to 75%. Go figure it out. Right. And so we got together, and we brainstormed. We did all the things that make up uh, brainstorming and innovation activities, post-it notes and whiteboards and all of those things. And we tried a lot of things, and we experimented. And at the end of three months, we had managed to get that number up to 38%. And we went back up in front of the organization, and we said, look, you've funded us for three months. We've moved the number from 14 to 38%. Here's what we've learned. If you fund us again for another three months, this is what we're going to do. And the organization said, terrific. Go ahead. Do more post-it notes, which we did. We actually shipped code, believe it or not, features and designs and so forth. And at the end of six months, we got to 68%. Right? We didn't hit 75. We hit 68. The company said, you know what? That's good enough. It's close enough. We are going to move you to the next project. And we built whatever features moved the needle appropriately and could scale with the business that we were moving forth. And what that allowed us to do, by having those objective measures of success, we could make decisions based on objectivity, on observing what and why customers are doing. 
And when you do that, you collect a bunch of data. And when you've got enough information, you've got three decisions to make, right? The first, if the data says, hey, this is a bad idea, you should kill this idea. This is a bad idea. Don't do this, OK? Right? Kill the idea if the data says it's a bad idea. Maybe you get some data back that says, hey, you know what? This is a pretty good idea, but the execution is not moving the needle fast enough. That's when you pivot, right? You maintain your strategy. You change your tactics. When you find something that, that works well, that's when you double down. Right? That's when you scale it. That's when you optimize it. That's when you give it to more people because it's moving the needle in the right direction, but only based on those objective observations that you're making as you slowly increase it. Now, now look, there are easy parts of this and there are hard parts of this. Here's the easy part, right? Measuring. Measuring's easy, right? Just instrumenting the code in such a way that you're actually collecting this data. Talking to customers is easy, right? It gives you the qualitative insight to why Curtain, uh, uh, customers are behaving in certain ways, right? And then reflecting, coming together as a team and saying, here's what we've learned. This is what's happening. This is what customers are doing. Here's why they're doing it. These are the easy parts. Here's the hard part. Changing course. Actually saying, you know what? Yeah, we've gone down this path for three months. The numbers are coming back and saying, this is the wrong path to go down. I know, I know, but the, the executive really wants this to launch. Or wow, we've spent three months working on it. What are we going to do, just throw it away? Yeah. That's what you're going to do. You're going to throw it away because it's not meeting your business objectives. Right? The hard part is having the organizational and the team maturity to say, this is the wrong direction. Let's change course, and let's move on to something else. And again, from, from this uh, blog post over at the Guilf Group, I thought this was really interesting. They define two types of KPIs, key performance indicators. They've got high-level strategic ones that the company cares about for an extended period of time. And then they give teams these tactical KPIs to achieve that they know are leading indicators of these strategic KPIs. And the teams work on that until they hit those numbers, and then they move on. Right? That's the tactical, that's the, that's the business objective to learn. And we have to build an organization that takes advantage of this small team, and that allows them to come up for funding periodically. Right? It's almost like a startup. Right? You funded us for this amount of time. You've given us this objective. After that amount of time, you can say, look, this is what we've learned. Will you fund us again? And the organization gets to make an evidence-based decision about whether or not it's worthwhile to actually put more money into this particular path. Okay. The last thing I want to talk about is this. How should the team work? Right? We talked about the, the makeup of the team. We talked about how uh, we task the team. And the reality is, what should the process be, the final things? How should the process be? How should the team work? And then once again, we're going to start with a few anti-patterns, how the team should not work. So first and foremost, a, a lack of cross-functional collaboration really starts to break down a culture of learning and a culture of innovation. Right? These are, this was a, a bit of an excuse to put more circus photos up here. But uh, just to give you a sense, uh, those are the elephants, obviously, on the end. Uh, the women in the middle walked on large white balls up ramps. That's what they did. And that's Charlie. He served our meals three meals a day. If you were brave enough to eat food from Charlie, um, and most days we were. Some days were a little sketchier than others. Now, look, there was no cross-functional collaboration uh, in, in the circus. In fact, the silos were so deep, they were, they were interdepartmental silos. The clowns fought each other over who originated a gag, right? I mean, can you imagine if the, if the human cannonball, and we had, a, we had a tiger trainer, right? We had 10 tigers. If the human cannonball and the tiger trainer collaborated, right? The guy's already flying across the tent. If there were 10 tigers underneath there, What's the difference, right, ultimately? But at the end of the day, the excitement of that act is, is 10x, right? None of that ever happened because everybody felt like they, they would be giving up something unique if they let go of their, of their originality and collaborated with somebody else. Another anti-pattern is a fixation on job titles. Right? We get so hung up on what it says on our job titles. Right? Oh, you're the designer. There's no way you can code, right? You're the engineer. There's no way you can design, right? And thinking about that greatly limits the contribution that our small teammates, our small team members, can make to the process of learning and innovation. Right? To drive the point home, I want to share with you this photo right here. Does anybody know who this guy is? Any guesses? Take a guess. It's not Nigel from Spinal Tap, but that's a great guess. It's not Gene Simmons, but you guys are in the right era, for sure. It's not Randy Rose. That's a really good one. I've never heard that one before. That's a good one. All right, I'll, and, uh, and I'll give it to you. Uh, this is who this is. This is Jeff Skunk Baxter. Uh, Jeff Skunk Baxter was a founding member of Steely Dan, and he was a Doobie brother for 35 years. 
legendary American rock and roll guitarist. Any guesses on what he does today, other than play nostalgia concerts at state fairs? Human Cannibal, it's a good one. Uh, that one, UX designer, no, he's not a UX designer. This is what he does today, right? I'll let you read it for just a sec. Mr. Baxter is a consultant to the US government on missile defense. That guy, for better or for worse, that's the guy, okay? Point here is if he showed you his resume and it said, listen, founding member of Steely Dan, Doobie Brother for 35 years, would you let him within a mile of a conversation on missile defense, right? And of course the answer is no, we would never let him do that because we get hung up on that job title. Again, people have secondary competencies and passions and they, they're really good at other things. Let's not uh, limit their contribution, especially in the early stages of a product, right? During product discovery and conception, Inevitably, people will fall back to their core competencies, right? Engineers will write code and designers will design. But especially in the early stages of a product, let people contribute in whatever way that they can. Okay. Other anti-patterns, a fear of failure, right? Ah, my ass is on the line, right? <laughs> right? If I, <laughs> if I don't get this right, something's gonna happen. I'm gonna get fired, I'm gonna get demoted. Right? We create these cultures, but we never consider the scope of the failure. Right? Think about that Amazon scope of failure. Right? If they get 11.6 seconds worth of a release wrong, that's terrific. They've learned something, and they can roll it back, and they can move that forward. Right? If we take small risks, then the failure brings learning. That's the experimentation, and that's what we should value. We shouldn't make people afraid of actually getting something wrong. That should be actually ultimately encouraged. Right? Uh, another is arbitrary deadlines. Right? If you owe Pauly money, you got to pay Pauly. Right? That's, that's kind of how it works out. Right? Arbitrary deadlines are typically just motivational tools. Right? There's usually no real reason to get something done by a certain date. And we talked about earlier about what happens when you fix date and you fix scope. Right? If you fix the date, that's fine. But let the teams build the best product that they can by that deadline. Right? And then let them continue optimizing it after the deadline passes. What, what ends up happening here is the teams end up building this CYA culture right, where uh, all we do, we do just enough to get things done and then to move things forward to the next thing, right? We never do our best work. We never take risks. We never innovate because we're afraid that we're not going to hit the deadline or that we're going to get fired and so forth. And so the things to think about, right, is how does a culture of learning change the way that a team works, right? Ultimately, so we've talked about who's on the team and, and how we task the team, but how do, we, how do we actually get them to do their best work? And there's a couple of different ways to do this. First and foremost, people take smaller risks, right? That's the first tack. This could essentially be the, uh, you, could, you could argue this is the MVP for the GoPro camera, right? Let's get that out there. Let's try it. Let's see if it works. Let's see what kind of product we get out of it, right? There's a key principle in lean thinking that says that we're always moving from doubt to certainty, that between us and the end state of perfection, which we never attain, right, there's a fog. And we can only see two or three steps into that fog. And so we, to mitigate the risk of running in the wrong direction, we take small steps, right? We take small risks. We run experiments. We test our hypotheses, and if the results from that experiment come back and confirm our thinking, we keep going in that direction. But if the results come back and they say that was the, that was the wrong way to go, we roll back or we pick a different direction, right? Because we don't want to run head first into the fog assuming that it's the right way to go, right? We take smaller risks. This was awesome. I ran into this. Uh, I, this is uh, Map My Run. You guys know this app? I was running in L.A. this summer. Um, while I was working out there uh, early in the morning, you can see the dates, the timestamps, so you know that I, I'm not lying. 6.54 a.m., I was already out running. Um, and uh, I got to the end of Venice Pier, right? Venice Pier is beautiful. It goes a half mile into the, into the ocean, and the sun is rising, and the palm trees are swaying, and the surfers are out. And so I paused to take a break and kind of take in the scenery, and I stopped the tracking of my run, and this beautiful uh, a modal window comes up. And it says, hey, would you like to take photos? and add it to your run. And at that moment, I was feeling particularly inspired. Adrenaline's flowing, and I'm sweating, and I'm breathing heavy. And I said, hell yeah. I also like the fact that they use the, the term MVP, right? Coming from the lean world, they mean most valuable player, of course. Um, but I said, terrific, go MVP. And I tap go MVP, and they're like, all right, great, give us 30 bucks, and you can totally do that. 
And I was like, wah, wah, I can't know. No way am I making a rational purchase decision at 7 o'clock in the morning, wheezing, can't breathe, and my eyes are burning. But, so the end, the end of this workflow is kind of crappy, right? But the beginning, right? None of these features here ever have to exist, right? All you have to do is put up that modal and count the taps on Go MVP and no thanks. Right? And when you get enough that say, yes, I like this, that's when you start investing in actual feature development. Right? That's a small experiment. That's a smaller risk that you can take to see if there's any value in actually investing further in building this particular product. Right? Because the, the, the Agile world has come up from an engineering perspective. Right? The, the 17 founder, writers of the Agile Manifesto were engineers. And typically, Agile in most organizations that I deal with comes from the engineering department. It's very rare that the designers are like, let's do Agile, and the engineers are like, no, we don't want to do it. Let's do Waterfall, right? Um, it doesn't happen. But what's happened is that we've built these amazing organizations, these amazing software engineering organizations that are incentivized for the efficient delivery of high-quality code. But what, we, what the, the Agile process doesn't have, as my friend Bill Scott likes to say, is a brain. It, it, it's, it lacks the capacity to determine what to build and how to implement it and how to design it and what copy to put on top of it. And this experimental, hypothesis-driven approach where we take small risks and then we learn from it allows us to drive the Agile process in such a way that we get great code and great design and great copy that customers actually want to use because we've measured their behavior. That's our definition of success, right? It's a change in customer behavior. And we have to remember that works as designed is simply not good enough anymore. So one more, uh, I just want to prove to you how healthy and athletic I am, so I'm going to use one more athletic story here. But uh, this is my picture of my gym. I live in New Jersey. This is a picture of my gym. This is my favorite feature at this gym. It's called the cardio theater. And essentially, it is uh, a movie theater with cardio machines in it. That's it. So instead of putting your headphones on and watching a movie on a small screen, you get on the elliptical or the treadmill, and they, they blast the movie out at you in the morning. And I like it. I love that feature, in fact. Um, I usually go in the mornings, and so I arrive around 5.30. 4.30 in the morning, the guy comes and opens the gym. He turns the lights on. He pushes play on the movie. He sees that there's uh, a picture, and he hears that there's sound. As far as he's concerned, works as designed, right? And then he goes back to the front, uh, the front desk. I show up at 5.30 along, along with half the population of northern New Jersey. For some reason, everyone's awake at that hour. Um, and as soon as you get more than two people back here running on a treadmill, you can't hear the movie anymore. Right? Unusable, undesirable. Works as designed. I have to get off the treadmill, go to the front every single day, and tell the guy to turn it up because we can't hear the movie. Right? So we have to ensure that just because a feature works as designed, people actually want to use it and can use it. And the way we do that is with clear definition of success. Can we change customer behavior in the right way? And we can measure that. And we use that as the, as the, as the mile marker for whether or not we're building the right things. Now again, we want to promote competencies over roles. We want people to do whatever it is that they're good at to help us move forward faster. And then lastly and most importantly, we want to promote team self-organization. Give teams a little structure and then let them figure out how best to work together and how best to achieve the goals that you've set out for them. Right? This is a quote from Jeff Nicholson who uh, invented the post-it note. And he said that 3M wanted to productize this thing with Six Sigma as soon as he had thought of it. And he had no proof that customers actually wanted this thing yet. Right? We don't want to impose a process on a team just because we think it's good for the, for the production of code or the production of features. Right? Let the teams figure out exactly what they need to build and when they need to scale it and how best to work together. Last thing I want to say. This is hard work, all of this. Everything I just told you to do is difficult. It's process change. It's culture change. Why should you do it? Right? Why? Why invest in it? If things are going OK, why do it? First and foremost, you're going to make your customers happy. Right? You're going to build stuff they actually want and can use, which means they'll come back and use it. And they'll tell their friends. And they'll share it. And you'll have more customers. You'll reduce waste by building more successful products and not working for a long time on products that don't stand a chance of success. We'll focus our people and our time more effectively. And then lastly, this increases employee morale. It allows people to feel like they're part of a greater whole, 
there's a, there's a bigger mission, their ideas count, they're loyal, they're passionate about the ideas because they are ultimately their ideas that solve these problems. And that's terrific for your hiring brand and for your retention over time. At the end of the day, let me leave you with this, okay? You have to transform from a culture of delivery, right, focused on getting features out the door, to a culture of learning. Thank you very much for listening. I'd love to take your questions. <laughs> questions, I know we have mics over there. Yes, sir. So you give some great examples of companies that do this, right? They iterate fast, they learn quickly, they try a lot of experiments, yeah. like Amazon, Facebook, even Google. But there's a company that writes a lot of software that doesn't seem to do this, and that's Apple. And nevertheless, they've been very successful. So can you explain why they managed to get things right without seeming to try all of these constant experiments? I, I, so I would argue that they do experiment and, I, and that they, do, uh, they, they certainly do a significant amount of research. I just don't think that we see a lot of it. And I don't think that uh, there is, uh, I, 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 they're certainly not public with it like, like the rest of the companies that you just mentioned, like Google and Facebook and so forth. Um, I think what Apple really excels at is understanding ecosystems, and they do this by observation and by research and by learning. And then where they come, they, they, they uh, take ambitious gambles at design-driven innovation to solve the problems that they're, that they're viewing in these ecosystems. Now, you could, you could say, look, hey, you know what? Um, they, don't, they don't test, and they don't talk to customers. Um, I think they do talk to customers, and I think they absolutely build prototypes and run experiments. They seem to lose them in bars in Palo Alto fairly regularly. Right? But also, take a, look at, um, take a look at the iteration after iteration after iteration of the hardware and the software products that you're using for them, and you can see that those essentially end up being experiments, right? I mean, the, the, the original iPhone feels like, you know, it feels like a, a rock compared to like an iPhone 6 these days, right? And I think that there's, there's uh, experimentation and tons of learning there. Um, in, incidentally, so, so, I think, so I think that's one thing. Um, related is there's a Chinese company called Xiaomi, that uh, manufactures uh, cell phone, uh, mobile phones, and tablets, and they're competing directly. They're trying to compete with Apple anyway. Um, they do iterative design on their hardware and their software in one-week iterations, which is amazing. Like every Tuesday, they ship 100,000 phones. People snap them up, and they're, they're on the phone with these people, and, and they're measuring usage to understand how well the products are meeting their needs. And so that's what I've seen as evidence of that. Now, the last thing I'll say about this, because the question, this question comes up all the time, is you can't dismiss some level of design genius, right? There, that has to, that, you have to give some credit to, to Steve Jobs and, and you know, the very few people in the world who are like him, like Johnny Ive and so forth, right, who have this design genius. I don't think you can dismiss that as a part of the component of their success. But I think the design, the design genius, the creativity comes in in solving real problems. And they see those real problems by observation and understanding ecosystems. That's what I think. Yeah. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the structuring of small teams in big organizations such as uh, here, yeah. where there are literally hundreds of engineers and tens of product managers just in one product. Mm -hmm. So do you see these teams like forming and reforming? Do you see these teams like cross product, cross function. So how do you imagine them work? And then related to that, what is the decision making process like in that structure? Yeah, it's a great, really great question. Um, I, I don't claim to have all the answers. I can share with you a couple of anecdotes from my experience and something interesting that I heard um, last week uh, on my travels. Um, so the, the team structure itself typically um, designer, product manager, and engineer. So like one, one, and then two to four engineers as far as each one of those pods. And I think you'll see that repeated in some of the other, um, like the Spotify white paper that was out. Um, I think what's interesting is if you've got, uh, so taking, taking the, the um, if you've got a big problem and you've got a set of engineers or a set of teams that are, are working towards solving this particular problem, I think you give that problem to all those teams. And I heard, um, I heard Mary Poppendike speak last night. Mary Poppendike is, is she's one of like the legends of the agile world. She's been around 35, 40 years trying to make this stuff work in large companies. And um, she, she said, she was talking about giving the, these pods, essentially, all the same problem and incentivizing them the same way. So everyone has the same incentives to achieve the same success criteria. And then they have to build dependencies on each other. They have to work together in order to achieve that overarching goal. 
Um, so, so that's that's one way to kind of unite them in a in a similar direction. I think the question then becomes, how do you make decisions? I've seen it work. Uh, I've seen it work one of two ways, and again, uh, that's just my experience. It's not necessarily the answer. Uh, either there is a a product lead, typically a product manager, although it could be it could be the design leader. There's a team lead who who makes a decision, and where I've seen it work actually more effectively is that there's a triumvirate of the product lead, the tech lead, and the design lead, who take you know kind of gather all these ideas from the team and then make a decision together and then bring that back to the team. So I've seen that work well, also. Yes, sir. I'm interested in constraints, okay. uh, things like uh, legal or uh, regulatory or just bureaucratic, mm -hmm. and where they live. So, you know, these are things are generally kind of uh, constraints on innovation as well, or at least, you know, boundaries of innovation. Should the team itself own that constraint and possibly be, you know, demoralized by it, or should it be external? In which case, it becomes kind of an enemy or a, 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 a systematic problem. I think I, look, I think you have to work within your reality. Right. So if you work in, in, in healthcare, there are going to be legal constraints and, and personal information constraints, privacy constraints that you have to work within. Same thing in financial services and so forth. I don't think that you can ignore them. And I think you risk uh, damage, forget legal damage for a second, but I think you risk, you risk brand damage um, if, you, if you choose to flaunt those in favor of experimentation and hypothesis. Now that being said, the rigidity of those constraints is Debatable, in, in in certain situations, and I think that if you can have a realistic con if, if you can have a realistic conversation with legal department, for example, or the branding department, or uh, IT, or whoever is is constraining your ability to, to learn the things that you need to learn, I'm confident that you can typically find ways to to get around that. I'll, I'll give you an example. We did a, a lot of experimentation with a, a big financial services company down downtown from here. Um, again. 100-year-old brand, lots of financial data. It's risky. Options are um, you can test off-brand, for example, right? So it has nothing to do with the official brand. That's one test. You can opt people into a beta tester pool, right? So you're self-selecting a little bit. There's some bias there. You get the more tech-savvy individuals and so forth. But at least they've agreed to take part in these experiments. Um, but there's, there's a, there, there are ways to get around this where you can negotiate with the people who are constraining you to get some kind of learning. I, I think that, I think you have to own it, and I don't think you can disregard it, because ultimately whatever you come up with has to live in that world as well. And I think that if you disregard it, you're building something that's probably destined to fail. Yep. Yes, sir. Hi, I also have a question about the small team. So the first question is, uh, what's the best way in your experience to incentivize people to do their best within the small teams? And second question is, when you have the small teams and you want to encourage them to, to kind of all collaborate and work together on something, but then in that environment, how do you assign credit correctly so that people again have incentives to kind of? <laughs> well, you assume that, that taking credit is, is incentive, and I suppose that that could be. Um, the way, so again, based on my experience, the way that I've seen the, the best incentive has been to let people figure out the solution. There's an amazing level, th there's, there's, an exponentially bigger level of passion and commitment to the success of an initiative if the team, if the team is working on, a, on an idea they came up with. Right? The difference between telling a team to build something and telling them to figure out how to solve this problem is the incentive. That's what gets them to motivate. That's what gets them, gets them to move forward. And the interesting thing, if you take the, if, if you buy my concept that the atomic object of innovation is the team, then the team wins together or the team loses together. There's no, the team did great design, but the engineers messed it up, right? There's none of that. It doesn't happen. Like, the product is the product. You can't separate great engineering from great design, right? And we managed to, uh, you know, achieve our business goal and the customer's need, and it seems to be a winning product. That, to me, has been the greatest, the greatest source of incentive to get these teams to work well together. Okay? Anything else? Thank you guys very much for spending your lunch with me today. That was a lot of fun.